So <clears throat> I want to ask you a question. Any men when you were younger thought you were Superman? <laughs> thought you were invincible? You had an S on your chest and you found out it stood for stupid, not for Superman. <laughs> I, I know I'm not the only stupid one in here. I, I do remember one time move a, laund a laundry combination laundry thing and washer dryer combination and the spirit told me get some help. <laughs> but my ass said I can do it. <laughs> and I have two ruptured discs because of that today. The S is not for Superman. There's only one Superman I believe in and that his name is Jesus Christ. Every year in Spain there's a very famous thing that happens, it's called the running of the bulls. And I've never been there, I've watched it on television and I have two family members that they went to see it, they, they didn't participate in it, but one of, the, one of the problems they run in, they have all these guys over there that go over there and guess what the temptation is to do? When guys get, not very many girls, but when guys get over there, you know what the temptation to do is? And they're, most of them are, are younger than 35. They still have this S on their, on their chest. And the problem with running the bulls is sometimes you get run over. It's true. Sometimes you get run over. And we'll, we'll get to that later, Scott. It's in there somewhere. But let's bring up the scripture reading for today, Scott. Because God said something very specifically to, to Israel about the process of sanctification. You realize that in salvation God brings you out of the world and into himself and into the kingdom of his dear son. But do you realize once you're in the kingdom God has a process and it's called sanctification. So sanctification is very important, important to salvation because salvation leaves us in a place where yes we're born again we know Jesus Christ but we don't grow and mature into who God has called us to be. So I want to read something that happened in Israel that God began to deal with Egypt, excuse me, Israel after they'd come out of Egypt, because they couldn't quite get Egypt off of them. You ever met any believers? They came to the Lord, but they didn't quite get all of the world off of them. And God told Aaron, he said, I want you to get your sons. And he said, once a year, I want you to get a bull. Have you anybody ever tried to wrestle a bull? I, I've tried to wrestle little ones. And they're powerful. They, they, they're just unbelievably powerful. And I, and I thought when I was a kid, well, I'm going to go out there, I'm going to show this little bull what's for. And I grabbed him and I was going to throw him down like they do in the road. You know, next thing and I, I was flying, the bull was standing there. A little, he was just a little guy. And he threw me up in the air. God said, he said, Aaron, I want you to get you and your sons. And he said, I want you to get a bull and bring the bull to the front of the tent of meeting. He said, I want you to beat him, bring him to the door of the church. The door of the tabernacle. And Aaron and his sons, you shall lay their hands on its head. And he said, I want you to slaughter the bull or kill the bull in the presence at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Now what is interesting about that, God said, I want you to get that stubborn old bull. You ever realize that bulls and ox are stubborn? Anybody ever dealt with a stubborn ox? Don't look at your spouse. I just said, have you ever dealt with a stubborn ox? Now I didn't say man or woman there. But stubbornness is something we deal with and is a human nature. And God said, Israel, you have some stubbornness I want to deal with. And he said, I'm going to equate that, to, equate that to a bull. And he said, the only way you can kill it, he said, you're going to have to get help to do this. And he said, I want you to do it at the door of the tabernacle. He said, don't bring the bull inside the church. My message to you is don't bring your bull inside the church. And all I said was bull. And God said, I want you to kill it at the door. And I'm going to tell you right now, there is power in the corporate anointing of worship and prayer and the congregational meeting of the church coming together as one in Christ. And we will kill more bulls corporately than you ever will do individually. Right now I know guys that, oh, pastor, I don't need to come to church. I don't need to come to church. And they think they're going to kill their bulls up there fishing a big lake today. And so God said... Israel, I've brought you out of Egypt, but he said, you brought a little bit of Egypt with you. You brought some of their stubbornness. You brought some of that stubbornness, and now that's on you. And he said, it's crept into the church. It's crept into the nation of Israel. So the slaying of the lamb in Israel was for salvation on the Passover. Amen? So the Passover was for salvation. We're saved by the blood of the lamb. 
Amen. Guys, I need some more lights up here. We paid our light bill, didn't we? Let's get these lights on. There we go. Hey, okay, hallelujah. And so I have one more, one more scripture I want to read, and it's in Psalm 23. And everybody knows this by heart, but let's just, let just read this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Anybody else enjoy the 23rd Psalm? It's one of my favorite scripture readings. I love that psalm. The revelation out of that psalm from God to David is a staggering thing. And he talks about the green pastures and the dwelling place in God. And I love that the still water. Everything in there says that God has a place of rest for me. God has a place where he wants to take care of me. Amen. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. In Psalm 103, it says, Know ye not that the Lord, he is God, and that he hath made us, and we not ourselves. For we are his sheep, and the people are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Say, I'm a sheep. <laughs> the problem with sheep is this. <laughs> the best description for a sheep I've ever heard is an animal looking for a way to die. If you've ever taken care of sheep, you won't believe how dumb they are. I've always wondered why God compared us to sheep. <laughs> I mean, why didn't he compare us to something else other than sheep? But that's what we got compared to biblically. So, as David writes this, he said, God has a place for sheep because I know sheep need a shepherd. I know sheep need a place where they need to be so I can take care. Do you know God said he is the good shepherd? I praise God he's my shepherd. So, as we get back to Israel... God had anointed Aaron and set him up as the high priest of Israel. And God anointed his sons, and God told him, I want you to kill the bull before the Lord. And what's interesting, he says, before the Lord. Everybody say, before the Lord. Before the Lord. Not, not at your house, not, not, not down, at, down not out at the lake today. God said, I want you to do it at the tent of meeting at the front door before the Lord. Yeah. God's very specific about how he wants Israel to deal with this bull. Because we need to find out what does this bull represent. God said, Aaron, I want you to do this. Th this isn't something God suggested. This is something God commanded Israel. Yes. You know, when you get born again, some of the residue of life comes with you into the born again experience. Yes. And some of the residue that comes with you comes into the church setting and the church experience. So we know the lamb was for salvation. We know that the bull was for sanctification. And this is something... What we just read there out of Exodus, many churches, they're not even going to put that up or won't even deal with this today. But God is very specific about dealing with some little word called sanctification. Nowadays, it's, you're, you're, if you're talking about sanctification today, nobody wants to hear this message today. The only message people want to hear today is God is for me. He's going to give me a Mercedes Benz, put money in my wallet, put money in my gold bank. That's all. That's, but I'm here to tell you God wants you to live a sanctified life. Because a sanctified life keeps the devil out of your pasture. Amen. The sanctified life keeps the devil out of your pasture. <laughs> the sanctified life keeps the bulls out of your pasture. God's given you a pasture and you're a sheep and you're letting a big bull run in there. And this is what God was dealing with. He's telling Israel, yes, you've come out through salvation. You've applied the blood. The door, the blood of the Lamb for Passover. You've come through the Red Sea in baptism. But now you're living in a situation where you've got a lot of Egypt on you still. And God said, I want to get Egypt off you and sanctify you. God wants to get the residue of the world you came out of off of you and sanctify you unto Him. I've always said if the church gets sanctification, we'll see glorification. I guarantee you that. So salvation is where God starts with it. But sanctification is where He wants to lead us and guide us. God told Moses, tell, tell Aaron, your son, he said, I want you to kill that bull right at the front door of the meeting. Can you believe that God would do that? Could you imagine you showed up here and I had a big old Angus bull out there and I said, okay, guys, I need some help. But this is what God did and God was making a very, very clear point here. Sanctification is difficult. It's not easy. 
Sanctification takes work and it's hard. And the reality is the enemy and the flesh will fight sanctification at every level. And God said the best place to kill this bull, this thing that comes against us of the residue from our past is in the corporate anointing of church. This is where the bull in your life gets killed, right here in the church, in the presence of God, the presence of the people. God is wanting to bring sanctification back to the church and back to America. Yes, that's right. That's right. Many churches don't even mention the word sanctification today in their sermons. Paul tells us, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. Your mind is not renewed. Do you know God is renewing your mind? Your soul is being saved. Your spirit is saved. Your soul is being saved. Your body, the blessed hope of our is the resurrection, of what the ball t tells us. But your soul is a work in progress with God. Amen. So that's the thing the enemy works on the hardest, your soul. So Paul says, I, I need you to renew your mind. He doesn't say get a new mind. He says, renew the mind God already gave you. Go back to the original mind that God gave you. Say, my mind is not renewed yet. I've had people oh, tell me, oh, Pastor Steve, I, I just love God, I just love Jesus, and that's all I think about or talk about. And then I talk to their wife, and it's like, that ain't even close to what he thinks about or talks about. <laughs> somebody will tell on you. Don't, 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 don't say those kind of things and think that somebody won't tell on you. I'm going to shock you, but everybody in here has bulls. We all have our bulls. We all have our sacred cows. Amen? Amen? So you can be in church and the residue from your past, it can still be strong and it can still be around you. And one of the things that in, 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 is indicative of this is stubborn. Being stubborn. We talk about strong as an ox. Let me give you an example. Saul never killed his bulls. Samuel identified Saul's bulls specifically to him. He walked right up to Saul and he said, here's your problem. He said, you got rebellion, and you're stubborn. He said, you're bitter, and you're stubborn. And you know Saul's bulls killed him? You know Saul's bulls killed him? And they killed his children's future. They killed his... It should have been King Jonathan, not King David. Saul didn't kill his bulls, and his bulls ended up killing him and his future and all of his family's plans. Rebellion and stubborn. And Samuel said, you're not even going to deal with this? The reality is David had to kill his bulls. Joseph had to kill his bulls. Paul, the apostle Paul did. Peter did it. And if Peter did it, anybody can do it. In fact, in Psalm 22, 12, the messianic psalm of Christ on the cross, he said, many bulls have compassed me strong. Bulls of Bashan have been set me around. And what, what, how did Jesus overcome those bulls? Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That's how you overcome these bulls. With the Word of God. So we're sheep in green pastures. Anybody praise God that He's put you in a green pasture. I love that. And if you don't kill that bull, that bull's going to be in that pasture with you running around. He'll be bullying you, eating your grass. Eating your blessings, the goodness of God in your life. He'll be eating the mercies of God in your life. He'll be eating the finances of God. The bull is hungry. Let me tell you, the bull is hungry. Jesus said the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Skull right. right. so told Aaron, I want you to kill that bull because if you don't, he's going to be in your pasture. Yet God has a plan. God wants you to live in peace and joy and prosperity. Do you know that is God's plan for you to live in peace and joy and prosperity? Yes. Beloved, I pray above all things that you would prosper and be in health even as your souls prosper. So God's interested in you body, soul, and spirit. I love that that John wrote that. He also wrote Revelations. So if you don't kill the bull, the problem is you're going to end up living with the bull. Have you ever wondered why a bull specifically like God? God had a lamb, you know, he had a ram, you know, they had the, the red heifer. But once a year, God said, I want you to get a big old knee, mean, angry bull and bring that to the front door of the tabernacle. Don't bring him in. And I want you to sacrifice that bull right there at the meeting of tabernacle. Why a bull? You remember when God had called Moses, he said they, they were there at the base of Mount Sinai. God had called Moses, he said, Moses, come on up, I want to talk to you. And Moses, the Bible says, was up there 40 days and 40 nights. 
And God was giving him the oracles of the temple, of the tabernacle, the processes and the sacred rites of the temple, and all that God had promised that he was going to do to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God was now relaying it. And the people got anxious because Moses tarried. Have you ever got anxious because God tarried a little bit in relation to waiting for an answer? Why a bull? And Moses, he comes down from the mountain. And he comes down to a church that's in an absolute mess and chaos. And Moses comes down and he gets angry when he sees what's going on. And Moses, he takes the, tabern the tablets, both all two of them, he throws them and he breaks them down, and he's the only man that's ever broken all ten commandments at once. He sees the children of, children of Israel breaking all of the ten commandments collectively, and he loses it, and he gets mad, and he calls Aaron to him, and he says, Where are your clothes? <laughs> and why is everybody else running around naked? And Moses is furious. Yeah. Rightly so. Yeah, right. <laughs> and you're not going to believe, you're not going to believe what Aaron tells him. This is the man. Do you know when we give the ironic benediction at the end of the sermon, the Lord bless you and keep you? This is the man that God said to give that blessing. Don't tell me you can't be in church and not have some bulls in your life. And Moses goes there and he said, what's going on here? And Aaron says, well, he said, because you tarried, he said, the people, they came to me and they said, Moses, we don't know where he's at. He may not even come back. We have no gods. Make gods for us. And Aaron says this. I told the people, give me your gold. And he said, I threw it in the fire, and this bull walked out. <laughs> That's what he said. He said, I threw this gold in the fire, and this bull walked out. Okay, none of us would ever make, a, make, make a, an, ex a, an example like that before God, would we? I threw this gold in the fire, and this is what walked out. Wow. And God chose this man to be the high priest of Israel. And there he stood. Moses is angry. And Aaron, what are you doing? And Aaron said, I took the gold that God had commanded us to ask the Egyptians for. And they willingly gave it over to us. And I threw it in this fire and his bull walked out. The gold that God had blessed the children of Israel with. The money God had blessed you and I with on the job that he had given us. And we took the money that God had blessed us with and we used it foolishly. So now because I bought what I wanted, I have to beg for what I need. The bull got their gold. You took the provision of God, Aaron, and you wasted it? You threw it at... It, it, you, and we know the Bible clearly says that Aaron fashioned... The bull. The Bible says, no, you go back a chair, uh, chapter and Aaron fashioned the bull. What are you fashioning with the resources that God has given you? And you're giving it to something that God has no anointing or blessing on. Amen. Don't tell me you can't be born again and not have a bull in your life. The sanctification process is what God deals with. And everything about this bull is God, is God telling Israel, I want you to deal with the sacred cows and the idols in your life. And anything that you have that is between you and God, that is more important than God, is an idol. And God said, I want you to sacrifice that bull. And that bull represents an idol before God. And they are strong and they are powerful. And God said, you're going to need a corporate anointing to break some of these bulls. To kill some of these bulls, you're going to break. I know guys that have killed big bulls in this church. They've killed pornography. They've killed alcoholism, drug addiction, messing around with women. I have seen God do that my Lord. But they did it in the corporate setting and the anointing of the church. They didn't do it sitting down at the bar. This is where God said, we'll kill the bulls here in the corporate anointing. You do it at the corporate. You do it at the meeting house, the tabernacle, the front door, he says. One of the things I love about good men's meeting is when we really get into the, the crux of life, a lot of times we deal with the issues that men deal with and we kill bulls in men's meetings. Amen. God says, I'll tell you what, you want a golden calf, you want to have a bull, I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm going to teach you. He said, I'm going to teach you this bull is going to steal from you. Your sheep in my pasture, and you have invited a big, nasty, angry bull into the pasture God has put you in, besides still waters, green pastures, the blessing of God, and you've invited a big bull into the place God has set you. God said, I'm not having this. He said, my salvation was too expensive for you to waste it and invite the devil to come in and live in your life. 
The bull going to come, he'll steal from you. He'll eat all your green grass. He'll drink all your still waters. He'll lay down where you're supposed to lay down. The problem is he will take your blessing, your anointing, and he'll take it from your children's children's children. If you don't believe me, ask King Saul. So the bull represents anything that comes between God's children and him. Anything we serve other than God is represented by the bull. And God said, once a year, I want to remind you. I want you to think about what is it that you have that you put before me? What is it that you think is more important than me? And he said, once a year, I want you to bring that, and I want you to get rid of it in your life. Once a year. Yes, amen. So you come here next week, and there's a big bull at the front door. <laughs> We're going to have some fun. I will need some volunteers. <laughs> The children of Israel, they'd seen God's power. They had seen it destroy all of Egypt, the power of Egypt, the ten plagues. They had witnessed all this. They had witnessed the Passover by the blood on the doorpost and the lintel. They had watched the death angel pass over. They had seen God's power. Ten miracles of God showing His power. And God said, in that, I'm going to judge every god of Egypt. I'm going to judge them with the plagues. And one was the bull Apis. <laughs> That's who they worshipped. His name was God Incarnate. That, that, that was Apis, their bull that they worshipped. Their, their head God. God Incarnate. Wow. God said, I'm going to deal with that bull. So God said, Israel, I've shown you my power. I've shown you my greatness. And they saw Pharaoh chasing them in the desert. Do you know why Pharaoh was chasing the Israel, children of Israel in the desert? Because the devil will also always, always chase anything he thinks he still owns. He will, that's why the drug dealer called you after you got saved. He wanted to know, is this real? You cannot know how many people I know got saved, born again, and guess who, guess who one of their first calls was? The drug dealer that they got delivered from. You get born again saved, you, you'll have an old girl call, friend, girl call, friend, call you after you're married, she'll call you. Listen, I want to tell you, he, they want, the devil wants to know, is this thing you did with God real? That's right. That's right. Satan will always chase what he thinks he still owns. That's, right. That's why you wonder, why is the devil after my kids? Maybe you need to let him know, kill that bull in your life. Yes, kill that bull in your life so the devil won't keep coming after you. Yes. Do you not understand Joseph in the perfect life that he lived? Satan ran a bull at him in Potiphar's wife. He said, I'm going to run a bull at that guy. I'm going to see if this is really real in his life. And Satan ran that bull at her, and Joe, Joseph, what do you, he took that bull and he kicked it in the head and he kicked her out of it. And yes, he went to jail for it, but he didn't lose his future over it. Right. Satan was trying to steal his future in green pastures with God had made for him. Right. Satan said, I'm going to run this bull at him see what happens. I'm going to see if he's going to let this bull jump in the pasture with him that I've given him. The enemy chase anything he thinks he still owns. And people come and say, Pastor, pray for my kids. I, I'll, I'll flat out ask you, what are they doing? What bulls have they let live in their lives and in their pasture? This is a real thing with the Christian experience. The sanctification process. Passover, the blood of the Lamb. Red Sea baptism. God healed the waters at Mara, the bitter waters at Mara. God sent down manna from heaven. And they'd seen God work in might and power. And when Pharaoh drowned in the Red Sea, the problem is some of the residue of Egypt did not drown with Pharaoh in their lives. And some of that residue is still on the children of Israel and saints of God. Some of that residue can still be on you and me. Right. When you get saved, there's always residue that needs to be washed off. And that's why the New Testament talks about the washing of the water with the Word. Hallelujah. Say, I need washed off regularly. I need washed off regularly. If you, if you took a spiritual bath as often as you took a shower, you know, it, it might be amazing what would happen in our lives. This is washing of water with the Word right here. This helps keep the bulls out of our lives. And that's why being in church is so important. And people have a misunderstanding when I talk about this. Well, Pastor, you're just harping on that. No, I'm trying to get God's blessing into your life. I'm trying to keep the bulls of this world out of your life. God said the church house is where you kill the bull. This is where you kill the bull. That, Paul says all this is written for our understanding. He said everything in the Old Testament, he said that was written so you'll understand how to live in the New Testament. Amen. That's why being in church is so important. You have to kill the bull in the, in the corporate setting. And I'm going to get to that spiritually in a little bit here in the New Testament for you. 
Because it's going to happen in the presence of meeting. Why the enemy will always come after you and chase you. He wants to see is that salvation experience, is it real, is it still powerful? Is it still having control of your life? Does God still really own you? You ever been in the Lord long enough to see the enemy come at you different ways? It's like, my goodness, Lord, where, where is this coming from? The enemy's trying to find out, do, does, do, does God still have 100% of you? Does God still have all of you? The reality is Pharaoh's dead. They're in a new location, a new people. They are now a nation. They're not just a people. God's working mightily. And this, they decide, this ain't good enough. God's feeding them from heaven. I don't know about you, but if, if I woke up every day and there was man in front of my door, I, I, I probably would be praising and worshiping God. How about the rest of you? Yes. The reality is you wake up every day and God has manna in front of you and we don't even realize the manna that God has. If you got a job, that's manna. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. I didn't say welfare. I said if you have a job, that's God working for you. And God is working mightily. And they decide we would rather go back to Egypt. The leeks and garlic and onions of Egypt. We would rather go back to the taskmaster and the daily beatings and whippings of Egypt. And they had forgot that the blessing of God is more powerful than the curse of the devil. Do you know what's so important about walking in the blessing of God? It is going to affect where your children walk with God. That's right. It will affect where your children walk with God, brothers and sisters. Sanctification is a process. So the Bible says, let me explain it this way. Whom the Son is set free is free indeed. Amen. What does that mean, though? We, we quote that scripture, but what does it mean? So let me talk about this. So example is... Through the blood of Yeshua, we're free from our sins, and we are pardoned from our sins in our past. Amen? Amen. Jesus, with His blood, has removed our sins through the remission of sins. Right. That's free. Free indeed is now. I'm free indeed, so now my deeds don't mess my life up. Right. My deeds now are godly. And so my deeds now bless my life. Instead of before I came to Christ, they used to curse my life. Anybody before you come to Jesus know your deeds curse your life? But when you came to Jesus per Christ, pretty soon your deeds begin to bless your life. So now I'm free from my sin and my past through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. My sins are gone, but now indeed means my deeds are now blessed and they're not cursing me and they're not shooting myself in the foot. Hallelujah. Amen. So now I'm free indeed, not just free. My deeds don't mess me up anymore. Anybody in this room just... Some of the deeds of your life just cause some spiritual issues that you may even be dealing with years down the road. I don't know about you, but I want my deeds and my actions blessing me, not cursing me. Right. I want them blessing my children. Amen. So the children of Israel are free. They're free from Pharaoh, but they weren't free from Egypt. They weren't free from their own spiritual issues. And they had some sacred cows that they had brought with them from Egypt that they had not killed. One of the things the children of Israel had observed in Egypt was the Egyptians' worship of a bull named Apis. And so when the children of Israel tell, told Aaron, hey, make us gods, what did Aaron do? He fashioned the gold and the silver after the god Apis, the bull, in Egypt that they saw in Egypt. And then he said something that I can't believe God didn't strike him dead. He said, these be your gods. These be your God. That's what he said. My goodness. They took the blessing of God and they threw it at an idol. They took the blessing that God had given them. All they did is tell the Egyptians, hey, give us your gold and your silver. And the Egyptians, they just start handing over. God said, I'm going to pay you back for 400 years of service. And they took that money and they go out in the desert. And because God tarried just a little bit, they got frustrated and they got angry. And they, well, Moses ain't coming back. We don't know about this God. He feeds us every day. We have fire by night. We have a cloud by day. He's taking care of us, but it ain't good enough. I'm going to tell you right now, one of, the best, one of the worst things you can do is start complaining about a God that's blessing you life and taking you care mightily. And it's not good enough for you. It's a place for the enemy to jump in and say, oh my goodness, here I can work here. And they just throw the blessing at the devil. They took that blessing, they threw it at a, a golden calf. And the devil was just ripping them off. Do you know everybody takes an offering, not just the church? 
Okay, guys, you start dating a woman. She'll take an offering. I mean, honestly. Women, if you date a man long enough, he'll want an offering. You buy a dog, it'll take an offering. You be getting up in the middle of the night going down and buying dog food because you don't have dog food during the morning and you'll have to get up and go buy that mutt some food so he has food in the morning. That dog will take an offering. You have a goldfish, he'll take an offering. It's true. So we in the church, why are we the only bad guys? Yeah. Yeah. The devil takes an offering too. Yes, <laughs> take all that gold that God blessed you with, paid you back wages, and take all that gold and build an idol and start worshiping a golden cow. And the devil just like, my Lord, my, my goodness. And he just ripped off all the blessing that God had given them. A friend of mine one time, he's telling me, well, Pastor, I don't go to church because all you guys, you just want my money. I'm like, okay. All right, I'm not going to argue with that. And he said, and, and besides that, church is full of hypocrites. You ever, ever talk with anybody like that? You know, they talk, hey, when did you come to church? And all oh, church full of hypocrites, all they want is your money. <clears throat> so I messed with him. I said, I said, you go to the bar every Sunday? He said, yeah. He said, there ain't no hypocrites there. I'm like, okay. I said, uh, how much they charge you for one beer? And he said, five dollars. And I took the S off me that said stupid, and I put it on him, and I said, you're the stupid one. The devil is ripping you off. He's taking an offering from you right now, ripping you off. And you think the church is full of hypocrites, and you think the church wants your money? The devil takes an offering from you every Sunday at the bar. Every Sunday, can you say amen? amen. The devil takes an offering too. But we're the ones that get the bad rap. That's right. That's true. I guarantee you, $5 for a beer? And I'm a pastor, and I know that's stupid. Good grief. I told him, you know, you know the devil's taking an offering from you? Five dollars for... Wow. I put that S on him. So the church isn't the only one taking an offering. The devil takes an offering too. And the devil requires an offering. The devil takes an offering too. And he's demanding... And he doesn't have a return like God does. That's right. That's right. God told the children of Israel, just ask the Egyptians for their gold and they'll give it to you. And we're going to take the blessing of God. My green pastures. My still waters. And I'm going to throw the blessing of God at the enemy. I'm going to throw it down the drain. So that's where Aaron got the idea for the bull. He got it from the Egyptians when they were in the land of Egypt. And God says, I want to meet with you. And God called him to Mount Sinai and Moses comes down. And the children of Israel throw a golden calf in God's face. That's what they did. Now I know we would never do that to God. They throw a golden calf. And Moses gets angry. He throws the Ten Commandments down. He deals with the children of Israel. And God tells Moses, you're going to have to come back up the mountain because we're going to have to... Do you know the first Ten Commandments were written by God? Yes. Yes. Do you know, most people don't know this. The Ten Commandments were written twice. The first time God did it miraculously. He's by, the Bible specifically says, by the finger of God, God did it. Hewed out the rock, gave it to Moses, take it down there. And all Moses had to do was carry the finished work of God. So we have a holy God and they throw a cow in his face, a golden cow. And they take the blessings of God and they throw it at something foolish. Something ungodly. Anybody here ever buy something you didn't need? Or am I the only idiot that bought something I didn't need? And you know, as you get older, you get smarter than that. I don't need that car. I don't need that boat. I'm okay. Throwing something godly at something 
I remember I bought a piece of land one time, and, 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 and this is horrible. I didn't even ask my wife to do it. It was in 2005, 6, and 7. Anybody remember those days? I mean, the economy was booming. Everything was baking and shaking. We were buying and selling land. I, I remember one time we bought a piece of land. We fixed it up, and in 90 days, we made $40,000 in 90 days. Just like that. Boom! It was, so I was rocking and rolling. I bought this piece of land, and it didn't turn out so good. And I asked God about it, and you know what he told me? I didn't tell you to buy it. It's amazing the things that we do and when they, we demand God to bless it, even when it wasn't obedient. I'll never forget that. I didn't tell you to buy it. <laughs> Let me give you an example of this spiritually. Solomon says, he that findeth a wife findeth a good thing. Not he that findeth a woman. A wife. See, most men are out there looking for a woman. But if you're a godly man, you're looking for a wife. There's a difference between. Are you looking for a wife or are you looking for a woman? Are you going to take what God has given you? And are you going to throw it at the enemy? Or are you looking for something that really isn't God's plan? God said, men, look for a wife. Yeah. Any of you out there long enough, you dated a woman and you finally found a wife? Any of you women finally found a husband? Don't date a man... Date a husband. Date a man that's going to date a man that's living like a husband. There's a lot of men out there. They ain't worth five cents. He that findeth a wife findeth a good thing. Start looking for a husband. The children of Israel are out of slavery. They're out of Egypt, and they are now enslaving themselves back into the very traditions they left. And they are now worshiping the same God in Egypt. Right in front of the living God of the universe. They're worshiping Apis the bull from Egypt. God said, okay, you're going to do that to me? Here's what I'm going to do. Once a year, you're going to go get a bull. He said, you shove that bull in my face, I'm going to put this bull in your face once a year, Israel. See, Jesus, I didn't know God was like that. Yeah, God's like that. He has feelings. Do you know God has feelings? Yeah, Bible tells me he's angry, he's happy, he's just. God has God. And God said, you're going to bring a bull? He said, I'll tell you what. You're going to get a bull every year. You're going to bring it to the temple and uh, the tabernacle. You're going to bring it to the front door and you're going to kill it. And then God says something this way. He said, I want you to take the blood and I want you to go in the tabernacle and I want you to go through the out outer court. I want you to go to the inner court, the holy place, not the holy of holies. That's where the ark is. And he said, I want you to take the bull, the blood of the bull. And he said, I want you to put it on the horns of the altar of incense. What's God getting at here? That's what they had to do. The rest of the bull they had to take outside the camp. And they had to burn it. And God said, I'm going to remind you of Egypt. And I'm going to remind you of other gods and how they enslave you. He said, I want you to take this serious. He said, you're born again. You've, you've applied the blood of the Lamb. He said, you've gone through the Red Sea in baptism. I'm taking care of you in the wilderness. And now you're complaining because it's not good enough. It's time to kill some of the bulls in the church in America. Yes. The sacred cows. The idols. In fact, God puts it this way. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways, seek my face, I will heal their land. You know what's interesting is when, they, when Solomon, do uh, you know that when Solomon anointed that temple unto God, you know how many bulls he killed? He killed 20,000 bull. bulls. Bulls! Not, not lambs. 20,000 bulls, Solomon said. We remember what the children of Israel did with that golden bull. And they stuck it in God's face. And he said, when I, when I dedicate this temple, I'm going to kill 20,000 bulls to God to tell him, we'll never put anything in front of your face again and worship anything but Jehovah God. That's why he killed 20,000 bulls when they dedicated the temple. Read it there. Amen. So I'm going to ask you today, is there a bull in your pasture today? The green place of green grass where God has put you? Have you invited a bull in there? The problem with bull is there's always bull manure. I want to tell you, you can kill the bull. 
Yeah, and you grab that bull at the door of the tent of meeting and you kill it there. Don't you bring it into the tabernacle. Don't bring your bull manure into the church. You can do it outside. And don't bring it in the tabernacle. Take the blood of it. Put it on the horns of the altar of incense. The altar of incense. Altar of incense. What happened at the altar of incense? Okay, good. At the altar of incense, do you remember when Zacharias, it was, he was chosen due to his course of Abia, and it was his time to light the altar of incense, and he goes in, and he's lighting the altar of incense, and he's in here, and he's gone, and he's praying unto the Lord. He'd been praying for a guy named John, a little baby. He didn't know who it was yet. It's John the Baptist's daddy, okay? And he's in there praying. And he's at the altar of incense. He's praying. He's worshiping. The people are outside at the time of the evening offering, 5 p.m. in the evening. And he's in there lighting the altar of incense. And David said, Lord, may my prayers rise before you like incense. Yeah. The lifting of my hands a sacrifice. Yes. And that's when they killed the bull. Praise and worship will kill the bull. Amen. Corporate praise and worship. And prayer will kill the bull. Okay. Zachariah is in here praying for a baby. It turned out to be John the Baptist. I don't know if he's important or not. I heard his name. The reality, he's praying. The people are outside praising and worshiping God. At the time and the hour of incense, the time of prayer, they kill the bull. And God said, I've heard this one. And Gabriel comes down and says, I've heard your prayer, Zacharias. You're going to have a son, and his son, this son's going to be great and mighty among men. He's going to usher and herald in the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the man, Isaiah, that we've been waiting for for 2,000, 4,000 years. And that's what happens in corporate prayer, corporate praise and worship. You kill the bull. Amen. You want an answer to prayer? Come to corporate worship and prayer on Sunday morning. Come to corporate prayer and on Tuesday. Come to corporate prayer and worship on men's meeting. It's important to be in the congregation of the saints. Gabriel showed up when Zacharias was at the altar of incense. And God said, when you kill that bull and you take his blood and you put it on the altar of incense, I'm going to start answering prayer. I'm going to start answering prayer. I'm going to start answering prayer. You kill your bull, you kill your bull, you kill your bull, and you take that blood and you put it on the altar of incense. God said, I'm going to start answering prayer. Prayers you've been believing for, standing for. Why won't God act? Kill your bull and see what happens. That's right. Praying for a baby for years. It just happens the day he's chosen by the course of Abia to go in and offer the altar of incense. He's praying. They're praying. They're worshiping. Kill the bull. And God shows up. Oh, I wish people understood what I was telling you. You'd never miss a church service again if you got this in your spirit. Today, people treat church like it's a vending machine. Well, maybe today, maybe tonight. I got news for you. If you're wondering why God ain't moving in your life, maybe you haven't killed the bull. Yes, and one of the bills you need to kill is being in church. Amen. That's right. That's right. People think oh, nowadays it don't matter. I got news for you. You're wrong. Okay, so you come to me and ask for counseling. Um, and you say, something's wrong with your children. Something's wrong. I'm going to ask you, are you in church? Are you in church? I'm going to just ask you, do you meet at the congregation of the tabernacle with the saints where God told Israel to be? I think he said something about the Sabbath day. Keep it holy unto me. Right. Yeah. Yes, the Sabbath day is any day we have. Jesus Christ is the Lord of the Sabbath. I come to church not because I'm a pastor. I come to a church because I know there's a blessed in the corporate anointing of praise and worship and prayer among the saints of God. That's why I'm in church. If I wasn't a preacher, I'd be here. You don't get six out of six kids serving God just getting lucky. My mom and dad understood the power of the corporate anointing of being in church. Amen. And it might make you mad. I say that I don't care. I've seen God do it. God is faithful to his word. Yes, he is. Hallelujah. I, I know this is a tough message in the church today. Everybody wants to hear every day is a Friday and every day is a wonderful day. And God just wants to bless you and give you a Mercedes. I got news here. God wants you to sanctify your life. Hallelujah. Amen. So don't think the enemy won't run a bull at you. Ask Joseph. Ask David. Ask Peter. Ask John. The bull you allow in your life is the bull you put between you and God. And God required this. The problem is bulls are strong and you need corporate anointing to deal with it. So I'm going to ask you, do you have a bull in your life today? The answer to it is corporate. Corporate praise, corporate worship, corporate prayer. That's why Paul said, Do not forsake the assembling as some do. As you see the day of the Lord approaching. 
Here's what Paul said. He says, you see the day of Jesus Christ returning and you treat church like it's a vending machine? How many believe Jesus is coming back? Yes, he is. How many are living like he's coming back? How many are going to look? See, the lamb was for salvation. The bull was for sanctification or what I call galvanation. Galvanation is just something that when you put it on steel, it can't rust. It doesn't deteriorate. And God doesn't want your relationship with him to deteriorate. So when you're pastor, what is God smelling? The prayer of incense and praise and worship? Or is there a little manure arising in the incredible place he's put you? May my prayers rise before you like incense. The lifting of my hands is sacrifice. That's why God said, you take that blood of that bull and you put it on there and you begin to praise and worship me. And then God says, I inhabit the praises of my people, Israel. That's right. God said, you're praying and worshiping corporately. I'm showing up. Amen. Are there any sacred cows in your life? God told Israel, you shall have no other gods before me. No idols. It is amazing that Gabriel shows up at the time of incense and worship and prayer and praise. Today we need the church to be killing bulls and not running with the bulls. So we say, well, Pastor Steve, that was, that was Aaron and, and he, they were all doing, you know, it was a party. They were all naked. They were doing, they were crazy and... That don't, that, that don't have nothing to do with that. I don't live like that. Well, praise God. You shouldn't be living like that. But can I just give you the list of sins of the flesh that Paul identifies in the New Testament? That are just as bad as running around doing what the children of Israel did in the wilderness? <laughs> Aaron, what would you do? I throw this gold in the, in the fire and this calf come out. Stephen, what would you do? Well, I was just gossiping about her, but... At, oh, Jesus... Paul said, here they are. Adultery, yeah. Fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness. Idolatry, witchcraft, we don't have any problem there. Hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, debauchery, false testimony, rage, jealousy, rivalries, divisions, factions, discord, greed. Hold it, hold it. God said, I'm, uh, discord and greed are in the same, same list as adultery and fornication. I've met people that never committed adultery but are as nasty as a junkyard dog and as hateful as a junkyard dog. And say they're born again spirit-filled Christians. Angry as you can be. See, the bull is to deal with all these issues. Well, Pastor, I'm not in the bar today. Praise God. But are you talking bad about somebody? Are you lying about somebody? Are you talking division in the church? Are you talking strife in your family? Wrath, anger, bitterness, false test? This is serious business with God. All these are bulls. They're all bulls. Well, bless God, I don't have to deal with what a adultery or fornication. Bless God. Paul says you're halfway there. You're only halfway there. I love people that talk about the New Testament and the Old Testament. The New Testament of Christ in relation to what the law demanded. Do you know that the grace is more difficult than the law? Yes, it's true. The law let me have an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. You wrong me, I could wrong you. The New Testament says, love your enemies, pray for them that despitefully use you. Uh -huh. The law said it wasn't adultery until you committed adultery. Jesus said, if you think about it, it's adultery. Woo! So you praise God you're under grace? There's a few more requirements with grace. And Paul says here, you can't do it except by the power of the Holy Spirit. And God said, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit that will enable you to do it. Say, he's given me the Holy Spirit. He's given me the Holy Spirit. To kick every bull out of my life. So today, the words of Aaron. After he got straight with God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. Be gracious unto you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you his peace. If you receive it, say amen. 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 Hello one and all, we have been receiving questions regarding where to send tithes and offerings. If you'd like to mail it in, you can do so at P.O. Box 2223, Sholo, Arizona, 85902. 
And please, if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, share, and subscribe. While you're at it, like us on Facebook. Link is in the description. And follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Link is also in the description. Helps out us, helps out the channel, and most importantly, shows that this is a format you wish to see continue. And with that, we wish you a blessed week.